uh, but they took an active management role. And by the Great Depression, World War II, they codified that. They became an environmental management state. And oh yeah, we should record it, shouldn't we? Um, and so just remember, so we've only got one bureau in here that came after this time period, and that's the Bureau of Land Management. And that would ultimately be the catch-all agency for much of the rest of federal land. It's abbreviated BLM, and for environmentalists in the West, they call it the Bureau of Lumber and Mining because they see it as an agency that just liquidates uh, public property. But otherwise, we've got a, a, a pretty good sized management set of management strategies in the far Western lands, and not just forests and parks, um, but we've also got some land surveys underway, which we haven't talked about yet, but I'll bring in today, and, and some water projects that are gonna become critical in the energy for the, for the United States to fight this war. Um, these have all grown out of Republican progressive impulses, right? The idea was, you needed to get in there and tinker intelligently. You needed to make sure that we preserved forests. You needed to make sure that we used rivers efficiently, that, that we were able to sort of keep up with this growing technology and this growing science such that we continue to direct the nation towards a growing economy and, a, and an economy that had the same kind of opportunities it had in the 19th century. But increasingly, the federal government is shouldering these responsibilities. Right? This was once all sloughed off onto states and onto individuals. But through this whole period, we've seen they're not, they're not letting go of land. They're managing that land. They're managing that land with a purpose. They're, they're, they're mediating the experiences people have with the land itself. And in this period of time, when we think of big government, this is when big government came into being. It came into being to address the crisis of the Great Depression, which I'll talk about in the next lecture, and the crisis of World War II. And once it came into being, it didn't stop. It stayed there. And it was, it was rooted, its foundation were these environmental management activities that have been growing out of the 19th century. And the actions of World War II, as I suggested already, laid the foundation for the national security state. And we live today in what I would call a national security state, right? We're, we, we've got passports, we've got, it's difficult to get through borders. Um, there's a whole lot of keeping this area tight that was never there before World War I. Also an extension of big government. We're gonna look specifically at four areas. We're gonna look at water management. We're gonna look at what we did with the timberlands we had already conserved and how we put them into a settlement house vision how the United States wrestled with agriculture in this period of time, because we'd given all the ag land away, but it was in desperate need of science and engineering. And then we're gonna end looking at my favorite topic and the most overlooked but important topic in US history, minerals, and the way in which minerals and control of minerals laid at the heart of World War II and what came beyond. Um, and so we'll note through this, how an environmental management state emerged and then re-evolved into this sort of big government to win a two front war. And then as we look into the next unit, to continue to have that presence on a global scale and a global front. So the first strand of environmental management is related to water. We've seen this guy, we've seen this map before. We wanna know John Wesley Powell. Um, he, he was the one who pointed out that a distinguishing feature of the far west, and he did surveys in the late 1860s, um, was arid. And that if we were going to, if the United States was going to settle this region, it would be wise to rethink its settlement strategy and organize states around river basin drainages and the amount of water available there and the amount of water control that can be done per drainage. How much water is there will determine how many settlers should go and how they should settle. And he was saying at that period of time that this is a danger that we're facing. The press of American settlement is going to destroy these lands if they come out here and try to settle the way we settled the prairie. So he recommended in 1869 that Congress immediately suspend the Homestead Act, the one that had just gone in during the war, and revise it to make states that look like this. And this was his actual proposal. This colorful map was his, he produced it. And it uses the watersheds. He said, watersheds should be states. 
That's where we have enough resources to be able to manage settlement in a way that won't harm this environment. And so you calculate how much water flows and rains in that watershed. You figure out how many acres you can irrigate with it. And then you put settlement in behind that knowledge, right? So management of settlement was his idea to prevent the disaster of aridity. Powell was way ahead of his time. Like he was a crackpot as far as people were concerned in the 1870s. This was outlandish. He'd gone out, I'll explain in a minute, on his own self-funded survey, even though the government was spending money on real scientists to do surveys at the same time. So he was this weird character who happened to come up with this vision way before anybody else did, and nobody paid attention to him. Um, they shelved his idea until 1901 when Teddy Roosevelt became president, until a real progressive energy was in Washington, D.C. And that's when Powell's vision became a national agency. Um, the Newlands Reclamation Act, which was signed in 1902, created the Bureau of Reclamation. And it, it took Powell's vision. We need to develop around known water and irrigation. But it was thinking about it from a different side of things. It was looking at that landscape 30 years later, and it was saying it's too unpopulated. So this was designed to create farmland to draw settlement, right? How a solution of water management wasn't being put in place to protect the land from harm. It was being put in place to stimulate more settlement in the region. It was an attractive means of creating new farmland. And often the problem in arid environments isn't that the soils are bad. The soils are usually really good. The problem is there's not enough water. Water. So if you can control water, you can make the desert flower. You can make that happen. Um, <clears throat> there were two other forces besides the settlement force that were driving this idea to control water at the same time. One of them will remember Hetch Hetchy, New York City's Croton, Boston's um, Quabbin. Big cities were needing drinking water. Drinking water was created by putting up big dams and holding water in place. And then the other, and this would kind of drive through the center of this, was electrification. So by the dawn of the 20th century, it became clear to engineers that that smoky, steamy Pearl Street station was not the future of electric, electricity, but that hydroelectric, clean electricity. And it was seen as this like great, uh, clean, endless organic energy source for the future. And so dams were built with hydroelectric generators into them to use that falling water as a way of generating power. Uh, but irrigating farmlands was that didn't have enough rainfall was the number one priority. And you'd often see irrigation projects with electrification built in. And we can look at the first of these projects. This was put, completed in 1910. So you can see the reservoir that this little tiny dam creates. The dam is right there, little tiny dam, lots and lots and lots of water. And that water was then sent out into the desert to irrigate and create farmland and produce farmland. Um, this one did not have a hydroelectric uh, generator built into it. Because reclamation, the Bureau of Reclamation was really focused on the irrigation first. And California had this huge central valley with lush, deep soils and beautiful growing weather 12 months out of the year and no rain in the right seasons because it was a Mediterranean climate. This allowed them to control the water in Central Valley. Um, it was called the Orland Project and it was the beginning of a sort of larger vision for creating, we'll see in a minute, an entire plumbing works in this valley that moved the water to where it needed to be in the times it needed to be there to turn the Central Valley into this great productive agricultural empire. Um, so the photo on the left is a reservoir. Um, and then the water, the way it works is you spend this public money to build a dam and then you sell water allotments. And an allotment is enough to run a farm. The farmer then pays for that allotment and so it pays back into the system to support it and then makes money off of the water as well. And the idea is everybody wins in this system. Um, while Roosevelt's last year in office, the kind of crown jewel of the reclamation, um, irrigation, and hydroelectric visions 
uh, was completed just outside of what is now Phoenix. Um, this captured thousands upon thousands upon thousands of gallons of water that allowed Arizona to become one of the capital crop producing states in the nation. Right? He was able to capture the water and then put it out onto and literally create farmland. But also, and this is where engineers started to see the real value of this, generate enough electricity to launch a city. And this is the dam that powers Phoenix. And suddenly there was enough electric, more electrical energy that could be consumed immediately coming out of this dam, but certainly enough to help Phoenix grow from a backwater desert outpost to the capital city of the Southwest. Reclamation kept at it in all of its regions. So up until the region we come to, there's a lot of water management going on. It's mostly focused on, on, the, on irrigation um, and having the water allotment be the key source of revenue, although in a number of places, they did something similar to the project uh, in, in Arizona. Um, but they got busy in the West and they got busy getting large federal contracts to reclaim land. They weren't the only dam builder in the game though. And there was a, an ongoing battle between the other agency that had traditionally been the engineering dam building water control agency. And this was the Army Corps of Engineers. Army Corps, so reclamation was created in 1902. Army Corps of Engineers traces its origins to the Revolutionary War. It's been around as long as the United States has been around. They built those canals in the 1920s, 1930s. They found railway routes. They straightened and they did cut flood control on the Mississippi. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers have been hard at work in the American landscape for quite some time and through all of the 19th uh, century. And coming into the 20th, they proved themselves to be big project masters. They completed Teddy Roosevelt's vision, the French's vision, the world's vision for a canal through the Isthmus of Panama. 25 years they've been struggling to get this canal through. The French started, they handed off the Americans. Then the Army Corps of Engineers took it up under Teddy Roosevelt and they finished it, right? This massive, massive earthwork. One of the engineering wonders of the world. So the Army Corps, these are not slackers. These guys know how to manage huge water control projects. It took them 10 years to build this canal. Um, but as, uh, as Woodrow Wilson is kind of reveling in the progressive world of uh, being a progressive Democrat, it's Roosevelt's vision that's getting completed uh, through Panama Canal. The Army Corps also contributed to domestic um, dam development and really energy development specifically. And so this dam re represents the first time that the Army Corps has been told domestically to do dam building. And they were asked to do dam building for power and for navigation. That's what this dam is called, the Wilson Dam. It was begun, you might notice, in 1918. It was begun during World War I when nitrates for agriculture were cut off to the United States because of the war. And the military said, we got to develop our own nitrate industry. To make nitrates, you need enormous amounts of energy. The hydroelectric dam was the answer. This was also a stretch in the Tennessee River called the Muscle Shoals, which was just unnavigable. And this allowed that water to become calm water and opened up the Tennessee inland further for navigability. Um, they, they didn't finish it until after the war, but it started, it put the Army Corps in this space in Tennessee where they said, wow, there's a lot of potential in this Tennessee River Valley to do both irrigation and energy. And this is an incredibly underdeveloped section of the United States. It's the Northern South. Um, so it's, it's kind of this in-between land and it can really use economic development. But both of these agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation staked out government contracts to build things in the first three decades of the 20th century. And they've proven themselves extremely competent at these programs. They were poised in a sense to jump 
economy collapsed. And I'm not going to talk about the economic collapse. We're going to get right into the New Deal. The New Deal was the democratic answer to the economic crisis that had hit the United States starting in 1929. The first 100 days of the New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed into law what's called the, the New Deal itself. And it was a series of bills that created jobs, that created projects, and that initiated a federal investment in economic development unlike we'd ever seen before. And it would only be um, surpassed by the federal investment in World War II that would start in 39 and, and go in full force by the end of 1941. Um, so he creates one of his first acts is to take up that Tennessee Valley potential, take up the Army Corps of Engineers and create a brand new US agency called the Tennessee Valley Authority. And it extended the vision of the Wilson Dam to the entire region. So all those red squares are the dams that were built along the Tennessee Valley and that were planned by this bill itself. The idea was both irrigation and electricity. Right, electrification of a region of the country that was wildly undeveloped even by the 1930s. Um, and so dozens of dams built all over the region. So there's the Wilson Dam again um, to, to develop the South, right? So this is, this is actually investing in an area of the country that's been neglected since the Civil War from, by the federal government, suddenly a huge investment. Um, and the crisis in that region was quite serious as well. And then jobs and development follow the electrical energy and irrigation. And in this interesting turn, we see the same words that were used by McKinley in 1896 being kind of refashioned. Now it's not about the industrial government, the industrial economy bringing prosperity and commerce. It's about American investment in its potential energy sources and its water control that brings prosperity. The federal government has a role in people's prosperity. Um, and so we see the, this investment um, really for the first time becoming associated, the federal government becoming associated with this way. Building dams creates jobs. And it did, it created jobs, thousands of jobs. Controlling the water created more jobs and more opportunities. Um, and the, so the Ten Tennessee Valley Authority, right at the beginning of the New Deal, takes up this huge chunk of land and puts the Army Corps of Vision into action. Um, we might remember uh, from the environment last time, the Hetch Hetchy and, and this aqu aqueduct that, that dammed this beautiful valley and ran across that big green stretch. But what about the rest of that huge green area? Well, the Bureau of Reclamations had a huge set of plans for that. And in 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as part of the New Deal, signed into law the Central Valley Project, which was to build this enormous plumbing system from north to south to turn all of that arable land into agriculture and subsidize the beginning of, a, of what would become the heartland of American agriculture, even to this day. Um, the, the Bureau had record, had been identifying these. And so you see the Central Valley under irrigation in the middle. That was impossible without this irrigation works. Um, and so enormous federal dollars. Where are these federal dollars coming from? We'll talk about this in the economy in a minute. But this is Frank and Della Roosevelt signing to spend millions, tens of millions of dollars. Where are these dollars coming from? Well, everybody's kind of broke at the 25% unemployment rate. They, they can't actually, so we're broke. We can't actually get out from taxes. Where does he get the money from? Bonds. 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 So, and what are bonds? Credit. It's credit. So essentially, in effect, the federal government is printing this money. And they're saying it's going to be valuable in the future. So we're so so there it's fiat money in a sense. And there was a whole lot of worry, like, is this gonna work? Is it gonna make things inflated, et cetera? It ended up working out really well. But as this is getting started, the president is signing off on tens of millions of dollars of federal dollars that don't exist yet. 
right? He's making an investment in a sense, and he's hedging that it's going to be successful, that it will have such a return, those dollars and more will be paid for. Um, so he does Central Valley, and then there's this huge, enormous, it's the largest river in the far west itself. Um, it's one of the most iconic water landscapes in the great west, in the far west. And it's a river that for the volume that it carries is insanely short, which means that it is deep and fast and very, very difficult to tame. But if you're an engineer who wants electricity, it's also an enormous source of power. And so both the Army Corps and Reclamation have been looking at projects on the Columbia River for some time. So far, but like there's no signing and all these like museums, watersheds, markings, and some of that. It's like the EPA has come to that doing that. So, so the EPA is not created until 1970, signed by Richard Nixon. It doesn't even, it's not even on the imagination of federal bureaucracy. Yeah. So, but it's it's a great question because when the EPA comes, it's looking at projects like these going, why didn't anybody ask about ecology? But nobody asked about ecology because one, the science wasn't quite advanced enough to be useful. But two, people were thinking about energy as power. They were looking at nature as a potential natural, national natural resource. Um, and that value was kind of the, the most elevated one, but really great question. Um, so the, yeah, so this is done under the, not with the, the oversight of any environmental regulators. This is done by engineers who want to capture power. Um, and, and so, like I said, largest river on the West Coast, huge volume of water, steep canyons, treacherous waterfalls, ideal. And two projects get signed in in 1933. The first is the Bonneville Dam. There's its location um, just east of Portland on the Columbia River. Um, it's at the break in the Cascade Range, that's the coastal range of mountains. So there's this tremendous drop. This river cut through those mountains when those mountains came into existence. And so it had long been an area that people had looked at for potential, but it wasn't until the funding of the federal government in the New Deal could pay enough for the Army Corps of Engineer to afford putting this dam in. And you might just recall the first song Woody Guthrie was singing was Roll On Columbia, Roll On. The second one was the Bonneville, uh, the Grand Coulee Dam. And so he's out watching these projects come in and writing songs about them. It closed off the mighty Columbia, right? It was finished by 1937 and it started generating electricity as much as Seattle and Portland could consume. And it began irrigating farmland in the interior of Washington, which had a, a bit of a, a rain shadow. Um, when the Bonneville Dam went online in 1937, it didn't have enough customers to buy all the electricity it was generating. Right? It was an enormous source of energy and potential energy. They had to not put some of their generators online uh, because they just didn't have the customers. And it contributes to the blooming of the rain shadowed interior Washington. A few hundred miles up river. Oh, there's the one more look at the. Two hundred miles up river, and in a Bureau of Reclamation project, gets the same funding at the same time. Actually, more funding. It's a very expensive dam. Um, this is the Grand Coulee Dam, one hundred sixty-three million dollars. It's so expensive because it's a mile across on the river there. Um, so we're talking about millions of tons of concrete and steel. Um, we're talking about all of this money being invested in construction and construction labor and construction materials in the region. Um, it was another work of engineering genius, but you can see it required lots of men, right? To pour these concrete footings in the middle of the river a mile across um, and all the, all the concrete. Um, Roosevelt went and visited, I think he was in this picture. That's Roosevelt in the car in the foreground. This was sort of one of his proud moments of, the, of the, seeing these projects coming into existence. Um, and there it is today. If you look in the upper right of the picture, that's the canal of irrigation that created a fruit tree industry in Western Washington by irrigating, again, um, dry land deserts with, with fairly decent soils. 
Um, again, when it was completed in 1942, it produced far more electricity than it had customers. And it also didn't have all its generators running until a war use was found for this energy. Anybody know where this energy went during the war? Two places, and I'll get to it in a minute. Any, any idea? Western Washington? Boeing? So Boeing becomes one of the industries. What do they do? Yeah, and what do you need? What's the most important material for aircraft coming over from this? Steel, maybe? Steel, well, can it, steel's heavy. Yes, right. And this is so the aluminum industry, which requires enormous energy. And then, and we'll get to it, this is where most of the bomb material was created as well, and the energy needed for that here and in the Tennessee Valley Authority energy um, space as well. But um, spawns, it's got more energy, it's got more water than can be used at once. It's not the last project. There's another project by the Bureau of Reclamation in the New Deal, and this is the Boulder Dam. It started before the Great Depression, but it got funding out of the New Deal to be completed. This is the dam. If you've been to Las Vegas, this is the dam that lights up Las Vegas. This is the electricity for that city out in the middle of the desert. Um, and, and some irrigation, but the really big draw of the Boulder Dam is the Boulder Reservoir. Outdoor lake recreation in the middle of the desert, and it's filled with boats um, to this day. Um, so the New Deal essentially gathered up these competing water control agencies under the same umbrella, calling it the New Deal itself, um, and provided public funding to invest in hundreds of millions of dollars of public works that were designed to themselves generate an income. Dams that were designed to irrigate dry fields and stimulate farming communities and dams that were designed to generate electricity and power new urban settlements. And these are the major projects you see, four major projects. There are some smaller ones around the West, but this is where the big money went. Um, so money and labor. Um, and so the New Deal in this way builds the environmental management state into a jobs creating and an economic development mission. And it gets it really fully funded through this period. Um, and controlling water for irrigation and controlling water for power became the foundations of the Western Empire. And in fact, a historian named Donald Worcester wrote a book called Rivers of Empire. And he says, really, in this period of time, the power in the American state shifted westward. Um, and it shifted around these federal agencies that are not only controlling water, but we'll see uh, managing forests differently and managing uh, minerals differently as well. Um, and so the landscapes we see circled as well, we just want to kind of recognize they became these huge engineered plumbing works. That's what we were doing. We were controlling water completely um, and not leaving it to its whims. And we were using environmental technologies and environmental science to do that. These dams, though, barely scratched the surface of the employment crisis. They employed skilled laborers. They employed a lot of people but they didn't employ the unskilled people. Um, and there was 25% employment. It was higher, sometimes 30, 40% in some of the cities. And if you were 18 to 30, it was 50%. Like there, it was really hard times. You wouldn't want to be a young person at the beginning, uh, an urban young person in particular at the beginning of the Great Depression. But the federal lands will come in to rescue that employment crisis as well. And they'll play a critical role in allowing FDR to offer meaningful work, meaningful physical labor, and a paid wage during the deepest troughs of the economic collapse. So there's Franklin, while he was governor of New York, this was his boyhood home. Um, it's called Springwood. It's up in Hyde Park, New York. It's now a national park and it's been preserved. When he took it over with Eleanor and, and it became his, he first started just restoring the land. Like, you know, he's from the Roosevelt's. He's already a president in the family. These are wealthy New Yorkers. These are elite people with lots of resources, but he's no longer farming this estate. So he wants to turn it back to the natural forest. 
And, um, and he begins to employ men in Hyde Park and around there to replant trees and to start to restore and to bring this native forest that once stood there um, back into action. And he gave him an idea. When the, when the economic collapse came, he was the governor of New York. And he said, oh, we could create an employment program. We got, we got forests that need reforesting in the Adirondack State Reserve. We can use our state lands and we can get the labor that we need in there to help restore it, to, to fix embankments, to, to build roads, to put in uh, campgrounds. We can put labor to work in our conservation lands in a useful way in New York. And he started doing that as the governor himself, right? And he started using state funding to pay for the investment in planting trees, repairing roads, building water culverts, um, et cetera. So by the time he took office in 1933, he was already primed with an idea that would ultimately employ some 3 million men. And this is the Civilian Conservation Corps. And I just want to read the whole statement because it's important how he frames this. He says, I propose to create the CCC to be used in complex work, this is in simple work, not interfering with normal employment. So he doesn't want this to be competing where there's a market and where there's labor, confining itself to forestry. There's a space where nobody's gonna be competing. The prevention of soil erosion, flood control and similar projects. So he's got conservation projects in mind. I call your attention to the fact that this type of work is definite. It's a practical value, not only through the prevention of great present financial loss, but as a means of creating future national wealth. So his argument was, we're paying these guys to do things in our public forests with money that we've printed that we don't have because it's going to return and it's investment. It's a good investment, he said. And in fact, unless you were black, this was a wildly successful program. It wasn't until the very end of it that they allowed blacks to, to benefit from the CCC. But if you were a young, urban, ethnic, unemployed man, young man, 17 to 28 years old, white or ethnic white, um, you likely found employment in the CCC. Uh, some 3 million people, right, between 1933 and 42 when the war begins. It provides employment. It puts these men up in a camp, so it pays for their housing. It provides work boots and work clothing, and it provides meals, two solid meals a day, more than these men were eating. And then, as it says, they are paid $30. Five of those dollars go into their pocket, 25 of those dollars have to go back to their families in the city, right? Um, and so this is doing this really remarkable thing. It's got millions of men in camps, and I'll show you in a minute where the, where the camps were, who get $5 a month that they, that's spending money. They don't need it for food, they don't need it for clothing, that's spending money, which means they're spending it in that local economy where that camp is. And $25 is going back to their family into that economy in the city where there's no money as well. So this is spending federal dollars right out and dispersing it into the economy. But it's also bringing these men who are urban men out into the forested lands of the United States to work on conservation projects. Um, they regraded banks. You can see some of the work that they were doing. They regraded banks, they built roads, they planted trees, they blazed trails, they constructed campgrounds and camp buildings. If you've been to any national forest or state forest and they got a cool wooden uh, camp hut there, you look inside, the CCC built it. They did this all over the United States, um, funded with federal dollars. And the work not only improved these landscapes, it recovered forests, it built better campgrounds, it created better access, it made better recreational opportunities. So when the war was over, people had things they could do, places they could go. It also improved the bodies of these men, the work, the physical labor itself. Here's Jeffersonian's agrarian ideal. Here's Frederick Jackson Turner's, the work of the frontier. What, what Franklin Roosevelt did was he put men, another generation of men, into working against the wilderness, into putting their bodies against nature. In this case, they were doing it for the sake of conservation. 
they were implementing a conservation ethic, but it seemed to have the same effect. It made these men physically stronger and it lifted their spirits and it seemed to enhance their sense of citizenship. They ate regular meals and they grew, as you can see, quite strong and healthy. Some buff young men out there. Um, the program itself was also a piece of political change. The federal government was printing money to um, that it was willing to bet it could pay in the future to pay these men. And that's where it was paying the money. These are the camps. Every state in the union, right? And so you think about this. The Democratic Party has suddenly arrived after really doing nothing for 70 years. The hands of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he takes full advantage of the situation and creates a situation where federal money is making people's lives better in every place in the nation. This was a genius program and it did create value and it created wild support um, for the New Deal because the New Deal didn't feel like money being wasted. It felt like commerce in your local town. It felt like dollars flowing again in the cities. It was making the economy work everywhere. And, and Roosevelt would gradually lose his popularity over the course of his four re-election. But this was the foundation that he laid when he started. I am here for everyone, ultimately, was his message. And, and in really significant ways, um, he delivered. Um, so this is the peak in 1938 when most of them were there. It's a strategic economic investment in social capital and in natural infrastructure. Um, the return on the investment here isn't as immediate as those hydroelectric dams, right? It's not like electricity is flowing more than you can ever use or, or you're pumping millions into local economies. But the use of forest lands in this way proved indelible for the success of the United States. And it, it ultimately created America's campground and national park experiences, which created recreational value in places where there was no recreational value. But it did this other thing too. It created a whole generation of men who had embodied the conservation ethic, right? Who had taken the ideas that Gifford Pinchot had thought up in the late 19th century and they lived them in an experience that also restored their bodies and their health. And so conservation, um, as some historians who looked at this say, became domesticated through this era. And America's ideas about what we ought to do with nature started to be more like your question, like really we can't destroy it, can we? And we see the first inklings of an environmental movement that'll emerge with these guys' kids and not with them themselves. Um, but a domesticated conservation ethic across the nation. The third area that the uh, federal government's gonna take up for environmental management was farming and farmland. All that green, that's it. That's our farmland, that's our, 80 to 100 percent of this land is being farmed, right? Mostly staple crops, but that's our farmland. That's what we have. And even though the United States had turned over all of its farmland to private owners and continued to have that as its policy, um, and it was hard at work creating new farmland, even though it had created land-grant colleges to train farmers in 1863 and the Department of Agriculture to bring science to save seeds to help farmers, the farming sector had been in dire straits through the whole industrial age. We remember this, these were the populace. These were the farmers who were left out of the urban growth. The farming sector lagged behind in an industrial economy. That was just the basic rule. This whole period we've studied, they have been trying to get some of the benefits that urban, the urban economy is getting. The problem with farming is that you don't, if you farmed, you know this, you don't have the money you need when you need it. You don't have capital when you need it to plant at the beginning. And then you harvest all of it at the end. And that's when all your capital comes in and you got to pay for all the stuff. And so then you don't have the money the next year. And worse than that, everybody's farming at the same time. So everybody harvests at the same time. So tomatoes aren't worth anything because your uncle's giving them away by the bucket full and there's no market. And so farming in a, integrated efficient capital market actually is really bad for farmers. It's really hard to compete and they had been feeling it. Um, another thing was true too. Farming had been taking place in these regions now for up to hundred years. 
farming without any real effort to restore soils, without any knowledge of soil nutrients, without any knowledge of agronomy. And so Midwest soils and Southern soils had been used up. They were depleted, they were eroded, they were without nutrients, they were not producing the kind of output. Um, so there was a real concern about farm land and about farm itself. And then crop prices, this was the hardest thing for farmers. They were always too low. They could never get the price that they wanted. Um, and so the highly regimented structured work of mass production supply chains moved the economy at a speed that hurt agriculture. That's the best way to put it. Um, the depression though pressed the United States into the ag space as well. And again, in 1933, in the first 100 days, agricultural and agricultural land oversight are going to become a central concern of the federal government. FDR signed the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Parts of this will be deemed unconstitutional. We'll get to that later in the unit. But finally, the federal government came to the rescue of these farmers in a way they had been asking since the bloody 1880s. Um, one, help us with a market. This surplus that we have all the time is driving down prices. And so the AAA created a pot of federal funds to buy surplus. Pour your milk into the ground, farmers. Kill those 80 extra beef cattle. Plow your corn under. Don't put that on the market. And here's some money to afford that so that we can get prices up for everyone. And then the second part of it was to get a handle and an inventory on our land, on agricultural land, in particular to understand soil, to figure out what was going on with soils, because soils are the foundation of agriculture. Um, photography and flight made this job so much easier for these government scientists. Um, they were able to fly over and take these large aerial regional shots and sort of turn their gaze on studying what was going on. Um, they were kind of trying to figure out where soil is good, bad, what's happening with drainage, how can we understand this whole landscape, and how can we bring science into the equation to help these farmers survive. Um, and across the South and the Midwest and across the United States, these offices popped up, these federal agricultural adjustment offices. Um, directed specifically to farmers. The federal government wasn't just saying in Washington, we care about farmers. They were sending scientists out to the field. They were establishing these offices. How do you make more money with farming? How do you plant your crops better? How do you maintain your soils? Could you plow differently so you don't lose soils? All these questions, they were there to answer. And then you see the, the mantra, our country, let's conserve it. The conservation ethic Gifford Pinchot's idea of making things last as long as you can, now being pushed by the federal government out onto farmland as well. Um, and really interesting because Gifford Pinchot had argued with the conservation ethic that forests should be treated like agriculture to be renewed over and over again. So his idea has come full circle to say, well, we've got to actually get that ethic in agriculture here in the United States because what we've been doing is undermining our Base and ruining our soils and eroding our soils. Um, so agricultural agents brought their knowledge out to the field, their knowledge of the entire region and their studied understanding of these soils. And they worked closely with farmers and they came up with plans and recommendations. And they were, this was really close government work. Like we're gonna help you through this, right? Here's how you should plant. Here's how you should plow. Here's how you should plan your business. Here's some funding to play for those surplus crops last year, the extra meat animal that you grew, or the surplus milk that you pulled. Um, but their goal overall was to get farmers into a space where they were making the right decisions themselves, where they stopped overproducing, where they were in a more coordinated form of production itself. Lots of work in the early New Deal, 33 and then 34, despite all of this effort, nature had other ideas. Even with all of this new science, even with all of this new attention, suddenly in the middle of the Great Depression, in this effort to restore farmland, everything went wrong in the Southern Plains. And we're looking at the area that was impacted. Five states, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, centered on the panhandle of Oklahoma, but also pretty bad up there in Southwestern 
multiple years of drought. This is the Great Plains. This is flat land where the wind blows pretty steadily. Multiple years of drought with a continued intensive farming and then no rain from 1933 to 1934. And then again from 1935 to 36. And then again in 1939 and 1940 gave three major pulses of dust bowl, what's called a dust bowl, of dust storms. Essentially what happens is the soil is so dry that it just gets lifted electrostatically as the wind comes through and just gets elevated to these enormous electrostatic clouds of dust. And then it blows away, like blows away, like dust was falling on ships 300 miles off the coast of the United States and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, hundreds of millions of miles of uh, acres of farmland literally blown away, just gone altogether. Again, Donald Worcester, um, he said this was one of the three major environmental disasters in human history. This is one of the worst things he says humans have ever done in terms of the scale and the scope of the impact. 1934, 1936, 1939, and 40, the region seemed to come apart, literally. Um, but people kept staying put, and this is part of what Don Worcester study was why, you know, when things are going wrong, why aren't they listening to nature? Um, where am I? So what happens is, is because at certain times of the year, the winds just get steady. When windy season came in 1934, it just started picking up dust and it just started picking up dust. And um, you could see these things coming from miles away. And people wrote about it. People obviously took photographs of these things as well. This blowing, stinging, gritty, dirt-filled air. And sometimes these storms would settle in for hours as the system creeped eastward. And so you'd be inside of your house listening to the rattling and seeing dust coming in the cracks on the windows. And people wrote about this experience as well. And then it left behind these. So there's a storm coming on. It darkens the day and it leaves behind a wasteland. Right, just destroyed these, these, these created moonscapes. It lifted living soil and sifted out the finest particles and put those finest particles on top. Um, ecological crisis caused by over farming an ecologically fragile landscape and a, a generally arid landscape. But it wasn't just an ecological crisis, it never is. Our ecological crises always involve social crises as well. And we suddenly started to see in the middle of this Great Depression, these huge pools of migrant labor leaving this part of the country for more often than not the land of milk and honey in California. The idea that maybe they could get a piece of that Great Valley, Central Valley agriculture. Um, so a huge wave of migration in 35, huge wave of out migration again in 37, and then, then again in 40. They were called oaky dusters or exo dusters. They had no resources. They had no money. Often they just had one family car and they made their way sometimes in groups westward to California. Um, they were looking for cities, but really the most opportunity they thought they were going to find was in California, the land of milk and honey. And the New Deal stepped into this crisis as well, right into the farm crisis. Um, it said, we've got to deal with this internal crisis of migration because there weren't enough jobs or land in California for these people to take up homestead. Um, it was foolish. They often had, ended up in shanty towns. Um, the migrants had no funds, they had no resources. And this was a serious internal humanity crisis that was taking place. So the Farm Service Administration stepped in and started building camps um, and started creating spaces where American migrants could have a home, a meal, and get themselves back on their feet, but they went further to the Farm Security Administration said, we need to lock this down in the States itself. We need to go back to America's heartland and make sure instead of people migrating to California and having to care for them in these facilities, let's get them resettled in their home states. Let's figure out ways to get them to stay put. And so as it found its way into agriculture, it found itself not only having to address ecological questions, but taking some really active approaches to the social questions as well, and using the natural world as a means of, of mediating those questions. 
Uh, but their goal here was to prevent a wholesale migration to California and to the West. Um, and so agriculture and rural people all become part of this environmental management state as well. Increasingly, it's hard to get out of the gaze of the federal government by the time this is over with. One last area we're gonna look at, and this is minerals, mines and mineral resources. And look, it's John Powell again. Um, he's up here again because his survey of the far west and the Civil War was in fact just one of several efforts. Powell funded his own. I mentioned he's kind of a, a coot crackpot um, citizen scientist who was out there doing anthropology and all sorts of things. He did what he wanted out there. The others were paid with federal dollars. There were four surveys in all in the 1870s. They were out there first and foremost trying to find the best railroad routes through the far west, but they were also trying to find mineral lands. So they mapped mineral lands that were known and they really hoped they'd find more, they'd discover more minerals through this surveying process. 20 years later, they still had all the minerals had been discovered by the gold rush miners in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, they are, so here are the four surveys and roughly what they covered, the, the upper uh, left is Hayden's team. I didn't have a map for that. Uh, but he surveyed up around the Yellowstone, Montana, Idaho area. So you can see there's a north one, a central one, a south one, and then Powell just cut through the middle of all of this. Um, and so they're trying to get, this is sort of, um, uh, um, I'm forgetting the expedition in the early century. Lewis and Clark on steroids. This is like Lewis and Clark on steroids, right? This is the same kind of mission trying to figure out what's there as quickly as we can, really aiming for minerals because gold, we want more gold, can we find more gold? We don't. But this became a conflict. These men were, conf were in conflict over who was supposed to be looking at which territory and et cetera, et cetera. And so Congress consolidated it all into what would become the US Geological Survey in 1879. And so this took up all of these surveys under one umbrella and it gave them permanent funding it first hired Clarence King, who was a Yale geologist and led one of the surveys, the King survey, um, but he was a terrible administrator. And so then they hired John Wesley Powell, who turned out not only to be an excellent kind of visionary for the West, but a great administrator. And he built the USGS into this agency that knew everything about the landscape of the United States, right? U U.S. Geological Survey, Powell said, it's got to do what his name says. It's got to survey the land. And there was a new technology, a new technique for cartography, which they were putting into action. Um, these are topo maps that use a straight line at a, a different separate altitude levels. So it gives the appearance of a three-dimensional image. It allows you to see the lay of the land in a two-dimensional image. And this is what they started to do east to west, let's get this whole country mapped. And let's. And they made them in these um, sections. And so, you know, these maps now exist. We've redone them with much more precision. But the idea was, we want to know what our country looks like. We want to know every part of it. And we want to have a record of every part of it. Um, they didn't find any more minerals. Though. So the minerals were, what, what, what was happening with minerals? We've talked about this a couple of times as we get into the 20th century. What's going on with our mineral reserves? Remember, Christian? We got more of them that are richer than ever. We're producing more metals than ever. But do we have more metals, rich ores? What's going on with our minerals? We're running out of the richest, right? They're gone. Like our richest ores are gone and we're mining really low grade stuff at this point. And so all of this energy to try to find more minerals didn't find anymore, which meant we needed to intensify what we were doing, right? And so let's enter, let's start the 20th century by looking at this gentleman, Charles Kenneth Leaf. He was a professor of economic geology at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and he had noticed in his training as a graduate student in the early 20th century, he worked in iron, that this mass production was eating up more and more and more of a finite resource. And you know, minerals don't grow back. They're not forests. They're not agriculture. 
right? Once you extract those minerals, they're gone. And the pressure from the economy of needing a steady supply of raw materials to fill that mass production supply chain. Leave notice that this started to create some international tensions that the companies, the countries that were moving the fastest into mass production were also the most nervous about having enough resources to keep that flow going. We'll remember the Berlin Conference in the 1880s that divided up Africa for Europe, all about mineral resources. That's what they were looking for at that point. World War I then um, ended up exposing this weak side to these industrialized nations, nations that did not have all of the minerals they needed to make weapons found themselves all of a sudden at a disadvantage because international flow of goods gets disrupted in the middle of the war. And so Leaf really spent two decades trying to get the nations of the world and the leaders of the world to recognize this diminishing supply of minerals was going to lead to conflict. That, these that all of the countries that engage in it were gonna run out of their resources and start fighting for the resources of the world. We knew where the resources of the world were by then too. We ought to just internationalize it and so kind of divvy it up for everyone. So in 1919, he tried, he was part of Wilson's League of Nations conversation in Europe. And he recommended an international minerals agency that protected small countries from large countries and divvied up in a fair way and was a, a neutral mediator in the resources game. That failed. Congress was not interested in a, any kind of international. We retreated to a uh, isolation in the, in the 20s. In 1925, he wrote an essay for Foreign Affairs, which is an international magazine about foreign ideas. And he said again, we are risking war if we don't get our resources that are diminishing in an agency that separates them from nation state conflict. Everybody ignored him again in 1925. And then in 1933, he was hired by the New Deal to do an assessment of the minerals in the United States. We hadn't looked at them since World War One, and his Council of Foreign Affairs concluded we have a really dangerous situation. We go to war, there are materials we don't have in our minds. Manganese, really important. It's a small amount of it, but, but it makes a big difference. Nickel, we don't have any of it. Iron, okay, we're okay with iron, but we're mining it at such a low grade that it's really expensive. So we can get better iron elsewhere. Um, 1933, he puts this in front of the New Dealers and they ignore it as well. They ignored it until Germany invaded Poland and World War II began. And then all of a sudden the question was, oh wait, we're going to war. Do we have what we need for war? And very quickly Congress passed Leith's idea, which became the Strategic and Critical Materials Act. And the United States got into mines, minerals, and the metal supply chain um, for the first time ever and they stayed in it because it became critical to their national security state. The law said, we got to figure out what we got. Well, Leith already had, it's bad. It said, we got to buy up as many external stocks as we can. And the federal government started spending money on foreign ores that we didn't have so that we'd get a stockpile. It said, we need to go back out. We need to send the USGS and its mining agency out to all of our mines and assess the potential for more development. We can't leave this to the whims of a mine owner. The nation state needs to know, and we need to identify alternative supplies for the minerals we don't have. We cannot come into this war unaware of where our weak spots are. Um, it also required that the United States build and maintain a surplus of strategic materials, war materials, sufficient enough to fight a two-front war for two years, like a lot of material, the, the, the strategic uh, and critical material uh, uh, stockpile would never get built, it was too big. It wasn't something anyone could hold on hand. And so it, the desire to have that stockpile created a real anxiety for the nation state coming out of World War II uh, because we were fighting a two front war and we won a two front war, but could we do it again? 
And that, that was one of the fears of the national security state coming out of this directive. Um, this was a sudden change of fate for mining because mining had collapsed in the Great Depression. It had, I mean, the minerals industry got hurt the worst and they hadn't come back to life even by the end of the 1930s. But suddenly being linked to the munitions industry and to this war production gave them a renewed life and a renewed scale. So out in the iron mines and the copper mines, the industries doubled down on their mass production, installing larger train lines, larger steam engines, pull out more material at once on this extremely low grade ore. And you literally, with this low grade ore, have to move mountains of material in order to get just a small amount of metal out of it. And so they literally begin to dig mountain sized holes in the ground. And we have some huge pits out in the West that began at this point in time. In copper, it was the flotation. So there's uh, one of those tramways that get the copper into its flotation tanks. And then new mass techniques for processing low grade iron ore as well. So just larger and larger amounts of material so that we can get the volume we need for the war. Trains, conveyors, gaping pits being carved where mountains once stood. And these enormous, unprecedented copper and iron and lead smelters, they were gargantuan, um, designed to churn out and they do more material than has ever been produced in human history. Our production for World War II, once again, was record-breaking, unprecedented. And the companies, and so we get, um, you know, you can see train cars of molten material. This is an individual next to one of the smelters, right? The human workers are dwarfed by the size of the machines they're working in. And when the war finally starts in 42, companies make the clear connection to the war in all of their advertisements as well. So this is the professional journal, the engineering mining journal. You can see Anaconda took its vertical mine, its vertical integration statement from mine to consumer and changed it with battlefront, right? The bombs, those are incendiary bombs, um, and then the airplanes dropping the bombs. Every single metal company and producer is making connections with their success and the success of the war itself, bombs, aircraft, etc. What do we need metal for in an industrial war? What do we need metal for in an industrial war? Vehicles, what else? Bombs, ammunition, ammunition. Weapons. weapons, everything. Like it's a metals war, right? It's a metals war. It's the mass production of consumer goods turned inside out towards warfare, right? We need metals for everything. And the United States becomes the biggest customer in the world for metals resources and mineral resources. As they geared up what was, as you can see here, a mass production war. Ford's auto plants were converted to tank plants, right? This was literally on the back of the mass production um, economy. The same production processes that had flourished in the 1920s to provide every household with a car and a toaster and a refrigerator and a radio now made war machines bombs and ammunition and you see gender because women were in the domestic workforce at this point. The same materials, the same materials that go into a Ford engine or an RCA radio or general electric refrigerator go into these as well, just refashioned for different, different purposes in a different way. And many of them made for a single use only. Oh, what a boon if you're selling this stuff. It's going out the door and it's going to blow up and here comes another one. It's going to blow up. Munitions industry is all about using a lot of resource resources. Charles Light was at the center of this whole conversation. So he was brought on to the war board itself. Um, and he understood more than anyone how critical it was to have not just iron and copper, but the different alloys that were needed to outfit every single soldier, millions of soldiers with a rifle, with enough ammunition and a bulletproof helmet, right? You just got to punch all those up. There. And these are not just iron and copper. These are, I talked about them in the Ford lecture, alloys. Without the alloys, the iron is useless. Without the alloys, the copper is useless. And I'm talking about some boringly named things like manganese. 13% manganese with iron makes iron bulletproof. 
That's what these helmets were, right? So they got enough of that to make them bulletproof. So you need to be able to deal with heat and shock and all of the different conditions of a gun. That requires chromium and tungsten and zinc and nickel. And we didn't even have nickel in the United States. We barely had any tungsten and we were running out of manganese. Small amounts make a big difference. And so what Leith did was he organized this command economy so that we started to build up a surplus of these materials, but that we also had sufficient materials to mass produce this war. So build a stockpile, but mass produce a war. And boy, did we. So here's the Kaiser shipyard. They're putting out six ships a month at this facility, right? Six ships a month. And these are not small boats that we're talking about. These are huge ocean going armor hulled fighting ships. One after another, after another, 1942 and 1943. And the surplus energy, we mentioned this already up in the Pacific Northwest started to be put onto the very expensive energy intensive uh, smelting process to turn to create aluminum itself. The, the, the mineral that makes aluminum is wildly abundant. The amount of energy it took to convert it to aluminum was out of range until we had all that surplus energy for the Bonneville Dam and, and the Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, electricity provided enough power to smelt that economically and then mass produce the aluminum that was then mass produced into the Air Force itself. All of these airplanes as well, inside of them is some variation of that Ford internal combustion engine and all the parts that are needed there as well. So the same production systems that produced the Roaring Twenties, now commandeered by the federal government, intent on managing its resources and focused on war, created a war machine that was unprecedented in human history. When did we go to war? World War II, when did we enter that war? This is a day that will live in infamy. That's what Roosevelt said. What caused us to enter the war? We must know that. Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. End of the year 1941, okay. When did we invade Europe? We know that famous scene too. Maybe see Saving Private Ryan, it opens. We always see June 6, 44, right? Two and a half years of mass production of a nation state focusing everything it had on producing a war machine that it was going to bring to Europe and to the Pacific. And I'll submit to you that just like the Civil War, right? As soon as Lincoln decided to go into the Civil War, it was done for for the South, even though we're gonna have to kill a lot of people. As soon as the United States touched France, the war was over. We had so much firepower. We were there to overwhelm the Germans. Now we often remember this. This is the this is actually the map that was used by the general commanders for the invasion. Um, we often remember this scene. This is called Into the Jaws of Death, and this is the Saving Private Ryan scene. This is Omaha Beach. Things went south at Omaha Beach. Things went really bad. They dropped soldiers into water shoulder deep, and the Germans up on the shore on the cliffs there just picked them off, killed thousands. It was a brutal, bloody awful invasion. It was the worst thing that happened on that day because on the other five beaches, we were very successful. Like we always tell that story and we tell the Omaha Beach story. But the real story of Normandy and D-Day uh, was the success. It was the five other beaches where that war machine landed and brought everything ashore. And that was all about funneling that war machine onto the continent ferrying it into France and beginning the march towards Paris and towards Berlin. And meanwhile, the Russians are coming the other way. It was over for Germany at this point, but Germany didn't surrender. And so as our soldiers continue to slog east, we start to use our incendiary bombs and our air force to destroy German cities. These are magnesium bombs. 
It's a burning chemical. It lights everything on fire and it burns at a white hot heat. And so this was the first massive bombing campaign. The Germans had tried to bomb London. This was about blanket bombing. It was about removing a city from existence. And it was about 100% annihilation. The idea was we'll break the will of the Germans. It didn't break the will of the Germans, though. And in fact, it wasn't until we got troops into Berlin. Um, but within 10 months of landing in Normandy, within 10 months, Germany surrendered. Hitler was dead. The war in Europe was over. But <laughs> um, now we want to just keep in mind, Europe was destroyed in the process of World War II. And we played a large part in that. And we'll see in the next unit, we'll pay a large part in funding its re restoration and rebuilding. So maybe those bombs weren't just one use. Maybe they drew in a new economy. Uh, but we still have a Pacific war to fight as well, right? And in the Pacific, it was a heck of a lot more complicated. In the Pacific, instead of having the benefit of a single land mass, the Pacific required a Normandy over and over and over again, this island hopping campaign where you had to invade from the sea. And the Japanese were determined to plug in and they were just awful casualties as we made our way towards the main island of Japan. By spring of 1945, it's clear we're closing in on Germany. We're hoping we can avoid an invasion of the main continent, of the main island of Japan itself. And so we start, the US starts a bombing campaign. This is just Tokyo, but it was the same thing. This was about incendiary bombs, 100% decimation, breaking the will of civilian populations. These were not militants, these were civilians that we were dropping these on. And still, Japan seemed unwilling to step down or give up. Uh, but we all know the United States had an ace in the hole. One of those agencies that had built those dams and created all that power, the Army Corps of Engineers, had also been brought on to a super secret project starting in 1943. It took place at 14 different sites around the United States. And only a few people knew what all those sites were in terms of their connection to each other, managed by the Army Corps of Engineers because it's got a power dam in Washington and it's got a power dam in Tennessee. And that's going to be the source of power to refine the uranium and the plutonium necessary to make blue bombs. You needed this kind of space and this kind of landscape and this kind of geography to invent the bomb. It couldn't have happened anywhere else. Our far west in that space became critical and critical space and a space for critical resources as the Manhattan Project got up and out of, uh, on the way. So they're hard at work. What are these scientists trying to figure out how to do? They're trying to figure out how to control matter itself. Well, I don't have a chalkboard. E equals MC squared is at the base of this. What does that mean? That's Einstein's calculation for the quality of the universe. What does E equals MC squared mean? Does anyone know? What does E stand for? Energy. Okay. Energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. What it means is in the very smallest, tiniest of things, in order for it to hold together, there is infinitesimally amounts of energy at play, that our whole universe is actually held together by energy, which if we could figure out how to get it outside of those atoms and we could break matter apart, wow, would we have a powerful weapon. Um, there was fear, I'll talk about this again in, the, in one of the later lectures in this unit, that the Germans were developing this bomb. So it wasn't idle that we put this in place, but we knew a year before we finished that they weren't even remotely successful. And we continued to develop it. Uh, e equals mc squared meant that uh, the amount of energy in any piece of matter was, excuse me, exponentially greater than its mass. And geologists like Life had found that there was actually material out there that would work in this uranium and plutonium. These are huge, relatively speaking, huge um, elements 
that are unstable because they're so large. And so they have the best potential to be broken apart, but all of them won't break. We need to refine it to a specific kind. It's hard to figure it out. And so they had to actually get the engineering of this worked out. Like, how do you get this stuff in the place? How do you create a trigger? How do you make it explode? Um, and they figured out how. I'll talk a little bit more about it again later in the unit. Um, and they did so in secret and they kept it a secret throughout the war. But by early summer, uh, Truman, who's taken over for Roosevelt, who knew nothing of the program itself, is suddenly told, we've got a weapon of mass destruction, of unthinkable power, and it's about to be ready. We want to test it, and then we want to consider using it. So July, I believe it was 5th, 1945 from the desert of Almogordo, New Mexico. The first nuclear explosion ever, the Trinity test took place. Um, when you get this PowerPoint, you can link onto some video of the actual explosion. The scientists there, they made bets about whether or not this was gonna catch the whole sky on fire and destroy the atmosphere. They didn't know what was gonna happen. This was really kind of like, all right, guys, let's see. Well, it was everything they imagined and more. Um, just intense. It was incredibly powerful. And again, I'll talk about the, the political decisions that got us to use this. And I'm sorry I'm going over by August. Race through this. First ever, twice, nuclear weapons used on civilian populations, on human populations, literally flattened um, these cities, turned them. It was worse than the, than the fire bombing. And worse than that, the radiation trickled out into the population over months, killing hundreds of thousands. The Japanese surrendered, and the United States found itself extended at the end of the war beyond its national borders like never before. It was in continental Europe. It was in North Africa. It was in the Middle East. It was in Japan. It was in the Pacific. It was in East Asia. The war machine had given the United States a truly global presence by the time the war ended in 1945. And this geography and the weapon that we learned how to use would, would challenge political thinkers to figure out how to manage the power we created for the next quarter of a century. Um, so the energy of water, work needed in force, minerals and metals for a global war. And this far west becomes the seat of American empire. So this is environmental management by the end of the war becomes what we'll, and we'll see this in a later lecture in national security state. The need to maintain control over these lands and secrecy over the bomb. The need to manage a nation state that was now global in, in, uh, global in power. Um, the other thing that happened, we just wanna, we don't, I don't have, I couldn't find a population map to show this, but Richard White has said during World War II, it was like the United States was lifted like a table and the population tumbled down to the West Coast. The war industries made the modern West Coast. It pulled millions of people to cities that had barely existed to produce the war machine and then they stayed. And so the modern West Coast comes into existence as well. And the, the global presence required a new set of state institutions. Inventing the atom bomb meant controlling the atom bomb. And like the Frankenstein novel where the scientist invention takes on a life of its own, the success of the environmental management state in restoring the American economy and redirecting labor changed the stakes of national government and created the need for national security. We'll see this in the next unit. We'll just notice one more time, it was founded on that far west that came into the United States in 1848. Sorry to keep you over. I'll see. See you guys on Monday, and keep in mind next Wednesday is a not class day, uh, so you only have one class next week.